So good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and congratulations on the extraordinary run for crime and justice. It has been almost 40 years, uh, and it has maintained an, a very high level of quality. I've, I've been honored to be invited to participate in it a number of times over the years and, and to be on the board. I, I think that it is uh, a unique contribution to the field, and, and uh, by all means, let's keep going to 2025 and beyond. Uh, so what I'd like to talk to you about is one of the things that I've written about in the past in crime and justice and, and uh, in other areas, which is um, in, in 1976 in a public interest article was labeled the Great American Gun War. Uh, the uh, author, Bruce Briggs, at, at the time was talking about the extraordinary uh, heat and, and the lack of light uh, in the debate over uh, gun policy during that time. Um, and he was able to uh, particularly reference the lack of any kind of systematic research that was worthy of the name uh, as of the mid-1970s, which is exactly when I first um, got into the, the trenches uh, in this area. But of course, Frank Zimmering was there before me uh, and was there as of at least 1968 with the Violence Commission and some important articles uh, that he was contributing uh, at the time. Uh, he uh, was uh, known to complain um, th uh, in, in those days about how lonely it was uh, and that he started this uh, field, really, e even though the topic, of course, had been very much uh, a matter of concern for, for hundreds of years. But the systematic research in that area uh, was simply lacking. Uh, he pioneered it and expected many a criminologist to fall in line behind him, uh, but really not much at all happened. And, and then I showed up uh, and maybe a couple of others. Um, but since then, there really has been the expected explosion in, uh, of, of research interest in this. And that's something I want to talk about, too. Uh, and I suppose uh, in thinking about it from a personal point of view, it becomes a memoir. Uh, much of my own career has been devoted to this. And, and uh, in terms of the policy uh, trajectory during that time, it would have to be seen as a losing cause. Uh, the National Rifle Association has become much more powerful during that time and, and now has its way with state legislatures and, and with Congress. Uh, we have the Supreme Court in the 2008 decision, the Heller versus uh, the District of Columbia, which for the first time established a personal right to keep and bear arms, uh, something that was not even on the radar um, back in the mid-1970s. Uh, and uh, maybe more, most uh, surprising and distressing is a, a rather sharp turn in public opinion around guns and an increasing endorsement of the idea that um, we should not regulate guns and, and that we should um, uh, use them, uh, distribute them widely and use them in self-defense. Uh, so in every respect then, it, it would appear that um, the, the pro-gun uh, crowd has been winning and, and it's easy to attribute this to politics, uh, um, but it must be said that research has played an important role in terms of the success that the program people have had during this time. Uh, and I just want to offer that as a warning to the people who advocate for evidence-based policy. This is one area where we have, uh, in a fashion, evidence-based policy, although it tends to be uh, very uh, selectively uh, used. Uh, but the, the research has been important. Uh, I'm going to organize what I have to say around uh, more or less four enduring questions that, that have occupied me and, and Frank and others who have been in this field. Um, the plus is because occasionally I add a bonus question under after the numbers. So the first one is, is does the type of weapon used in a violent counter, uh, encounter matter? And how does it matter? Uh, that is followed by uh, the question about how do we uh, account 
for the scope and impact of gun violence. Is it a serious problem or not a serious problem? And how is the social burden of gun violence distributed across society? Uh, the third question I want to talk about is um, the link between gun violence and the general uh, distribution and marketing of guns. Uh, so do we best understand the access by violent people to guns as uh, a routine byproduct of the legal distribution of guns to law-abiding citizens? Or, or do criminals have access regardless of what the environment is? Uh, and then the fourth question is, uh, does widespread gun ownership and carrying deter crime or mitigate crime? And you will recognize, that if you follow this area at all, that all of these have not only been hot topics politically, but also have been uh, much researched and, and a good deal of social science uh, publication on it. What I will not talk about is the kind of parallel line of research um, around the constitutionality uh, issues. Uh, it's certainly not my comparative advantage as a mere economist. Okay. So let me begin with question one, and that is, does the type of uh, weapon matter, and how does it matter? Uh, there's an old bumper strip that says, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Uh, and uh, that suggests that uh, the type of weapon does not matter, uh, that it is actually the intent of the assailant that, that, uh, that matters. And the type of weapon then becomes an incidental detail in that story. That position actually was um, endorsed by uh, a very famous uh, and reputable criminologist named Marvin Wolfgang in 1958 in his study of criminal homicide, where he mentioned really as a speculation, he had no direct evidence of this, that um, he thought it was true that it was intent that, that mattered and, and if killers were somehow deprived of guns, they would find another way, and, and there would be the same body count at the end of the day as there would otherwise. So that's where Frank Zimmering most notably came in early on in, in his career to take that issue head on and, and to do some systematic research on the question of instrumentality. Does the type of weapon uh, matter or not in terms of the outcome of a violent encounter? Does it matter whether the assailant is carrying a gun, what type of gun, does it matter uh, if they're carrying instead a knife or a club, uh, in, in terms of the likelihood that the victim is, um, is going to uh, be killed rather than simply injured. Um, and, you know, this, this fascinating question about why is it that some victims live and others die in serious and sustained assaults? Uh, again, was not on the radar for criminologists. Uh, that, that, that was not something that they were studying. And what Frank was able to show uh, through his research was, first of all, that the, what the public health people call the case fatality rate is much higher if the weapon used in an assault is a gun than if it's a knife or, or something else. So that, that's the first bit of evidence that the death rates from gun assaults are much higher. Um, and the second thing that he was able to show is that very often, even assaults that result in death are not sustained. Uh, they seem impulsive. There's often drinking or drugs involved. There is not the finishing blow, the coup de grace at, at the end of it that would ensure the death. Uh, that it seems much more random whether the bullet happened to hit a vital organ or an artery uh, instead of maybe being an inch off because there's no follow-up shot to finish off, off the person. Uh, he also found that many non-fatal knife attacks were very sustained and involved serious wounds and, and so forth. Uh, so what he concluded from that and then later in another study where he simply compared the different calibers of guns used in assaults uh, finding that large caliber guns were more likely to result in death than small caliber guns, that, that the type of weapon indeed uh, was making a difference. Um, and so that at the end of the day, uh, the surprise answer perhaps is that it's not just the intent of the assailant, it's the type of weapon that happens to be in the assailant's hand at the time the attack is made. Uh, I followed up by doing studies using more macro data instead of the kind of individual data. 
And also actually looked at a variety of other instrumentality effects. For example, I was interested in the question about the technology of robbery and how the weapon type in particular influences the, the choice of victim and choice of MO that the robber uses, uh, the success rate in robbery, the injury rate, as well as the death rate. And in all of these ways, it turns out that it, it, there's very sharp differences between gun robberies and other types of robberies, um, and that we should care about uh, what types of weapons are, are being uh, used. So that, that was the, the first uh, great finding, it seems to me, in this area. Now, uh, this is the, the alternative bumper strip that I like, is that guns don't kill people, they just make it real easy. And, and I think uh, you don't have to be an economist to endorse the idea that if you make something easier, it's going to happen more often if it's attractive to some people some of the time. Uh, of course, Frank and, and um, Gordon Hawkins extended this argument in a very interesting way in their book um, from 1997, um, Crime is Not the Problem, where they said the reason why the United States has such an extraordinarily high homicide rate when compared with other uh, wealthy nations um, is that we just have a lot more guns. Uh, it's not that we have a lot more violence. And in fact, our violence rates uh, are comparable in our large cities to what you see in Australia or in Britain or Canada. Uh, the, the big difference is that our violence is much more likely to involve guns and hence a much higher death rate. That's um, why we have the deserved reputation of being a very high on, on that scale. Okay. Uh, so that's the instrumentality effect. It shows up uh, as an old issue in law and policy, uh, even without the benefit of research. You know, certainly um, the, the goal of separating guns and violence is uh, as old as the, um, the, the, uh, almost the founding uh, uh, of the colonies back in the 17th century and, and uh, tracing that history all the way through. It was recognized that guns pose a particular problem to public safety. Um, it, there's traditional distinctions in the criminal code, whether an assault is uh, committed with a more or less lethal weapon is relevant to sentencing, the seriousness. Uh, much more recently, we had the Boston ceasefire intervention, uh, where the idea was there when they, they had an epidemic of gang killings uh, that the uh, goal again is not necessarily to reduce violence, but to sharply focus on, on the question about guns and how to get the gang members to settle their differences with other types of weapons or, or the, uh, other means entirely. Uh, and so that the uh, David Kennedy and Anthony Braga and the others came up with this idea of an intervention that was uh, designed precisely on this issue of discouraging the use of guns. Um, and allowing whatever else was going to happen, but giving absolutely high priority, top priority among the police to that issue, uh, using a retail deterrence strategy of, of identifying gang members, telling them next time their gang, anybody in their gang was using a gun, then they would um, all be held liable in, because they all have warrants out for their arrests and so forth. Uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods that came up with Bush 43 adopted that and, and also uh, Project Exile, the use of um, the federal uh, law to uh, sentence uh, felons in possession um, and again a deterrent strategy and, and, and of course these days there is a very controversial uh, targeted policing strategy on the street to try to keep guns off the street. Uh, the New York City being um, out in front on this with uh, about 700,000 uh, street encounters between police and, and what may or may not be suspects, uh, but including a lot of, um, but, but very much targeted on getting lethal weapons off the street. Okay, so important stuff, separate guns and violence. Uh, and the result will be fewer homicides. That's the great lesson from that. I think that's as well established as anything can be. It was controversial through the 1980s. I think the controversy has ended pretty much in the uh, social science literature. The second area that I wanted to talk about, turning the question to, is uh, 
the kind of problem that gun violence is and how big a problem it is. It, this may seem like an odd question if you're not an economist, but uh, it turns out to be an interesting one, I think, uh, and, and actually quite controversial, as I've discovered. Uh, from the point of view of criminal justice, um, we can say guns intensify criminal violence, uh, they increase the murder rate, um, they influence sentencing, and there's a variety of implications for criminal justice um, outcomes and, and policy in that respect, that, that is clear enough. Uh, what we had, in, uh, starting in the early 1980s especially, was the entry of a new perspective, which was uh, public health. The public health researchers who said, you know, wait a minute, if you look at the um, gun violence, what you see here is um, a major cause of early death uh, and disability, and something that should be viewed from that perspective, rather than from this crime perspective, uh, that it's one of the things that is reducing our life expectancy. Uh, and in fact, in 2009, as in other years, there's about 90% many uh, gun deaths as there are motor vehicle deaths. If it, that may be a surprise because there's so much more attention has been devoted to, to reducing motor vehicle deaths than gun deaths, and, and yet they're comparable in terms of the total. One of the things that this public health perspective, this way of accounting, that is to just look at how many people are, are dying or how many people are being wounded and disabled, is that it suddenly brings into focus the other great uh, killer, and, and that is suicide, and that, that while something like 68% of homicides involve guns, it is true that, that guns are also the leading uh, mechanism of suicide, about 50%. Uh, and uh, in fact, suicide accounts for the bulk of all the gun deaths every year uh, in the US. And so again, from a public health perspective, then that becomes uh, a very prominent aspect of this whole uh, story, as do Fatal gun accidents is something that has been entirely ignored in the criminology literature. But uh, you know, there's several hundred a year, depending on how you classify things. Um, a lot more gun accidents that are fatal than, say, crib deaths. And so once you get into that, then you start talking about designing guns to be safer, which seems like an oxymoron, but something the public health people have been concerned about. So this new accounting frame and new way of counting actually has pointed to a different set of policy levers and a really different way of thinking about it. And it also has pointed up the fact of what vast disparities there are in this area. So public health people are concerned about health disparities in a variety of ways. And if you look at homicide, you see that it greatly contributes to the disparities in mortality among younger people. Um, that for men 15 to 34, the homicide rate in 2009 was uh, 73 per 100,000 for um, black men aged 15 to 34, and just four for white non-Hispanic men. So this astounding uh, differentiation between the two. Uh, the, for for uh, African-American men, homicide is by far the leading cause of death between the ages of 15 and 34, by far. It has as many deaths as all of the other co next nine causes combined along the way. So in terms of this public health and disparity issue, this is going to be uh, something that the, the only surprise is that it's been ignored uh, during this time. Now, a less progressive view the, about the disparity is that somehow gun violence is not, quote, our problem, it's somebody else's problem, uh, and that it's uh, gang kids killing each other and why should we worry about it. Uh, so depending on your politics, you can read this uh, one way or the other. Polite society, we usually don't refer to this uh, last one, and, and I would guess most people here do not endorse it in the least. Uh, but I can tell you any number of conversations I've had over the years in, in arguing with um, with, with NRA members and, and others, that, that they say homicide is not a problem just because of these same statistics that I've been showing you and, and more uh, that lies behind it. All right, so even that, even that may be controversial. 
That takes us to a third frame, which is uh, I'm an economist and, and so I'm interested in the economic framework, which would take the view that says violence and gun violence can be seen as kind of a tax on our standard of living, uh, that we collectively are worse off because of the threat of violence and it has social costs that, that in fact are not well accounted for by just counting the victims in this area. Uh, the victims uh, are who they are, uh, and we know that after the fact, but we all face the possibility of becoming victims. And so for everyone here, then there is a threat of violence, which is, uh, uh, can be a drag on our well-being and cause us to do a variety of things to avoid that victimization. Um, some communities are terrorized by shootings, uh, mothers who can't let their kids uh, play outside uh, after four o'clock and, and sleep in the bathtub in, in some really impacted neighborhoods. But beyond that, beyond that, the, the threat of gun violence especially uh, and its uh, capacity to terrorize neighborhoods drags down property values, it reduces uh, business development in those areas. Uh, people who can move out uh, and that the result then is that this becomes a, a much more widely shared uh, problem than you might think if you just look at, at the homicides. I, I remember talking to Mayor Rendell when he was mayor of Philadelphia uh, and he, you know his greatest fear was that there was going to be a killing uh, down in, in the commercial area, uh, downtown Philadelphia, because he said that that would have a devastating effect on the number of people coming in to uh, have dinner there or go to a show or, or all that kind of thing. So th th there's these kind of ripple effects that are much more uh, broader than you might think. Uh, so what, what we did in this area, uh, Jens Ludwig and myself, was to, to say, well, well, let's try to uh, put a number on, on this much broader um, effect and, and do the accounting uh, in this area. So we did what's called a contingent valuation survey of a nationally representative sample. And we asked people, if you were given a chance to vote on a measure that would reduce gun violence in, in your community by 30%, by 30%, then would you be willing to, would you vote yes if it would raise your taxes by $100? Um, so it was kind of a familiar exercise um, of saying, here's a chance to vote on an, on an initiative. Um, we described the intervention a little bit, but gen in general terms. Um, some people we said $200 uh, instead of 100. Others we said $50 instead of 100. So, and, and those were randomly uh, distributed. So what we got out of that was some people saying yes and some people no at each price, uh, but we were able to trace out a demand curve for the reduction of 30% in gun violence. Um, and what we discovered was that it's about, when we multiplied up about a $24 billion value uh, in 1995 to reduce community violence by 30%. Um, and what was really interesting was that value increased with the income and the education of the individuals that were involved. And so in contrast to what the public health statistics would suggest about the distribution of, of the homicide problem, for example, what you see when you ask people ab about their concern about it as including their willingness to pay, uh, that actually increases with it. So a much different standard of living or, or much different distribution of concern that, that reflects the standard of living issue. Okay, so that's the uh, second, the, the third uh, question uh, that I want to take on is gun markets and gun crime. Uh, and in that area, uh, the, the question is how do criminals get their guns and, and how do they relate to each other? Um, and, you know, again, there is uh, two issues. One is, is the misuse of guns, just a natural byproduct of the kind of transactions that occur uh, all the time in the legal market. And the second, is, is it possible to uh, implement regulations that will actually successfully discriminate between use and, and uh, dangerous people on the one hand and less dangerous people on the other, or the law-abiding people. Uh, I, I, this has been much of the work that I've done over the years has been concerned with this issue of gun availability and, and how it's influencing gun use and crime. Uh, 
Uh, back in 79, I developed an index to measure the number of guns in private hands or the rate of gun ownership and demonstrated that it, there was a close link between that and, and gun use in robbery and other crimes. Uh, later that was refined, uh, working with uh, two people at David Hemingway's shop, uh, Debbie Israel and, and Matt Miller. Uh, and so we developed an index, a very simple one, that um, solves the problem that we don't really have a good measure of how, what the gun prevalence is in small areas. Uh, and the result uh, that we've seen over and over again in a variety of studies that have come out of this is that uh, really the prevalence of gun ownership has no effect on assault uh, or on uh, robbery, but murder rates are sensitive to gun prevalence and positively related to gun prevalence. The, the, the new bumper strip then would be more guns, more gun crime, and also more guns, more homicide. And that uh, seems very clear, but whatever the mechanism is that's coming out of it. So what we conclude is that the widespread ownership of, of guns uh, is not increasing the crime rate. And it's not reducing the crime rate, by the way. It is neutral with respect to the amount of crime. What it's doing is it's giving criminals the chance to use guns instead of knives. And then we know from the instrumentality effect um, that that is going to make a difference in, in terms of the outcome, uh, and, and particularly in terms of the likelihood of death. Uh, and we were able to document that directly and, and indirectly in a variety of ways. Um, now, the related question is, all right, that's true for the general prevalence of guns in the community. What about regulations that are designed to overlay on the, that prevalence and sort between people who have a criminal record and those who don't, or people who are underage and people who aren't? Um, and certainly that was what the Gun Control Act was about in 1968 and, and the Brady Act that followed in 1993. It was about the, the, the not reducing the prevalence of gun ownership at all, but rather this idea that can we somehow discourage more dangerous people and use from getting guns at the same time we allow most everyone else to have ready access through, through dealers. And by the way, can we insulate the states from each other so that Montana can go a different direction than New York along the way? All right. Um, well, there's again been a lot of social science about this. Uh, the, one of the, 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 the in implicit debates is between James Jacobs, uh, the NYU law professor, and Sudhir Venkatesh, the um, Columbia ethnographer. Uh, and what uh, we worked, Jens Ludwig and I worked with Venkatesh and looked specifically at what was going on in, in uh, the, the underground or informal gun market in Chicago. Uh, and what Venkatesh found from his ethnography was uh, that, in fact, the use and the gang, um, the the use and, and the people caught up in, in different criminal activities had a very hard time getting guns. Uh, there were specialists who actually were available for fifty dollars to to go and try to get them a gun. Um, this was not at all like buying a hamburger. And furthermore, they did not know uh, much about guns, which I guess is a good thing. And so in a variety of ways, it, it appeared that this market, contrary to what James Jacobs was said, is not the frictionless ideal market um, that we read about in the textbook, but in fact has a, a very high transactions cost. Um, the question about uh, still remains, though, about regulation and, and the work that I did with uh, Ludwig on the Brady Act um, did not find that that was influential. Okay, so the fourth area is self-defense uh, and uh, the use of private use of guns in what might be considered more virtuous uses, and that falls into two categories, starting with mitigation. Uh, certainly, uh, as long as we're talking bumper strips and armed society is a polite society, is the animus behind this. And we can uh, look to 1995, Kleck and Gertz, uh, article that reported 2.5 million uh, defensive gun uses in a year. Uh, that has, of course, had enormous play. And, and uh, in, in the marketplace of ideas, 
uh, it was very welcome and highly rewarded, I, 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 would, I would say. Um, it, it made Kleck into a rock star. Um, and in fact, it's mythical uh, that the number is absurd in a variety of comparisons that you could make with the number itself, which is vastly swamps all violent uses of guns in the National Crime Victimization Survey, um, if we compare it with the implied number of killings and everything. I mean, it's just completely out of bounds with any measure of reasonableness, but that hasn't stopped it from being incredibly important. Uh, and uh, the, the thing that um, I, I want to say about, about this number is that while I consider it mythical and that he didn't do the, the kind of reasonableness checks that seem appropriate for such a, a hot topic, uh, it did employ uh, good social science methods. And, and so it wasn't the work of a quack, but by any means. Uh, and it has required David Hemingway and a number of the others of us um, a, a lot of effort to look carefully at what's going on and why is it that you'll get a half, you know, one in every 200 respondents or one in 100 respondents will say, yes, I used a gun to defend myself uh, in the last year or the last five years. Um, the, the Hemingway comparison that I've always liked is that if you ask a representative sample of the U.S. population, uh, have you had um, a close encounter of the third kind? That is, have you met an illegal alien from outer space? Or illegal, who knows? <laughs> and, uh, 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 in the last year, then about the same number will endorse that as who will say that they used a gun in defense. So who, who knows what goes on, uh, but it, it ends up being influential, as I say. Uh, the, other, the other area here that has um, uh, also gotten a great deal of purchase in the marketplace of ideas is that there's a deterrent effect. The, the game changer, as I say, John Lott and David Mustard published an article in 1997 that claims that the shell issue laws deter violent crime. And these are laws that were introduced in state legislatures one after another starting in the, the 1980s that required that the local authority issue a, um, a permit to carry a concealed gun to anyone who met minimum conditions. And um, that, those laws um, are now almost universal if there's any restriction at all. In four states, there, there's essentially no restriction. Uh, and what, what they did, again, using good traditional social science methods was claim that they had found that the introduction of those laws had the effect of reducing the homicide rate. Their first article on it said it increased property crime. So they said it reduced homicide, but it increased property crime, and they had an explanation for why that might be true. Uh, then a lot later came out with uh, More Guns, Less Crime, uh, which I think is the best-selling book of all time from the University of Chicago Press. And um, where he reported a bunch of different estimates for robbery, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, you know, and, and so forth. But all of that has gotten lost, and the only thing that has uh, caught on is that every time he does an estimate, he finds a, a reduction in homicide. So that's the consistent result that comes out of this that if you adopt one of these laws, then you'll have fewer killings. And that uh, then uh, was uh, subjected to replication and critique by other good scientists who discovered um, lots of problems with it in the coding and in the method of analysis. It's not a, a robust result. There was a National Research Council panel in 2005 and said, don't believe these results. Um, but what difference has it made? <laughs> it, it's a, a very uh, attractive result to some people. Uh, I did some work on burglary specifically, residential burglary, and found that, uh, <laughs> yet another bumper strip, the, um, that Heller established the right to keep handguns at home, of course, and, and gun ownership at home has always been privileged in the law along the way. What, what we did was say, well, if you have a high prevalence of gun ownership, does that discourage burglary? We had unique access to the National um, Crime Victimization Survey data uh, and were able to demonstrate that the reverse is true, that if there's more guns in the county, that that uh, appears to be causally uh, responsible for an increase in the burglary rate. Uh, 
Uh, presumably because guns are such an attractive part of the loot, they, they make burglary more profitable. They're very easily fexed, fenced and, and they're valuable on the street and so forth. Uh, so more guns, more burglary. Um, but again, if we step back and, and say, uh, what, what do we learn from, from this history of research uh, of claim and counterclaim that has been done? Um, I, I would say the first thing is that the, uh, the thinking about the, the, the audience for all of this research is that it's simply human nature uh, that gun lovers embrace the claims that, that what is really a hobby for them, of target shooting or hunting, whatever it is, uh, actually has these uh, other much grander purposes and effects, that the protecting their family, protecting their neighborhood, protecting the community that it promotes the public safety in that sense is that, you know, you can't say this if your hobby is stamp collecting, but if your hobby is playing with guns or owning guns or target shooting, then you can say that you are serving uh, this public interest and that you're a virtuous person for that reason. Um, the, the science on, in this area has been highly contentious, but, but uh, because of the selective use of certain findings, very influential, I would guess. Um, and I would use Al Gore's line that the, the, the fact that the, the claims are far from proven is an inconvenient truth which has simply been uh, ignored. And so that's um, the sad story of uh, my last almost 40 years uh, working in this area. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the chance. I think it, it's a very important set of observations, um, and I, I don't have any systematic information on it, but certainly uh, it makes sense, and I have read personal accounts of, of people saying, well, I tried carrying a gun for a month, and it changed my whole worldview. I mean, that, that while I was carrying the gun, I found myself much more vigilant, that I started looking at other people that I was passing on the street as potential attackers. I mean, that it was generally that uh, kind of a cognitive dissonance, I guess, uh, that, that said, if I'm carrying a gun, it must be for a good reason. It's because I live in a mean world that's full of potential uh, threats, and I have to be ready for that. So I think that that's true. I, I have also certainly heard about people who say, you know, I used to avoid dangerous places at night. Uh, now I'm carrying a gun, and I don't anymore. And so, um, as a result, I'm putting myself, in a sense, at, at, at risk, which is exactly what happened to me when I started taking karate lessons. I remember that. It had, it had the, the same, uh, same effect. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful and very compelling presentation. I'm wondering if you seem to be researching the Done research on the effectiveness of gun buyback programs, say for like inner city crime prevention. There has been um, 
uh, quite a bit of evaluation research about gun buyback programs, and I, I think that those have been organized uh, out of a, a good charitable impulse. Uh, we got to do something, maybe this will help. Uh, there, as far as I know, has not been any instance in um, the U.S. context that has suggested that, in, in fact, that they were effective. And you have to ask you know, the question of, about whether there's a possibility of ready replacement, uh, if they're being bought back for cash as opposed to coup for coupons or something like that. Uh, it could be that, that the seller is trying to trade up to a more effective gun, uh, and that, that, that's something that... It, I mean, the, the, the door is open, unfortunately, in, in most everywhere to, to buying another, another gun. The exception that you might point to is the ban on semi-automatic uh, guns in Australia, um, where they uh, were going to confiscate all semi, if, following a, a massacre there. Uh, but they did have an interim period where you could sell the semi-automatic to the government uh, during this. So something like 700,000 guns were turned in. But there was a, a case where there was no opportunity to replace uh, along the way, and it did appear to have some small effect on what is already a tiny homicide rate, you know, 50 a year or something. So given, given all this work you've done over the last 40 years, what would be your top policy priority at this point to reduce gun violence? Uh, you know, of course, the answer to that question requires uh, defining the counterfactual. Uh, uh, what, what world am I living in when I... <laughs> So, I mean, in the world that even as it remotely approximates the one we actually do live in, uh, I think that the best hope is um, with the law enforcement and, and the courts in terms of um, getting particularly the courts to take gun carrying seriously by people who are prescribed for, for using it seems to me to be an available initiative maybe modeled on what MAD did for drunk driving uh, making sure that police are, are using best practice uh, in this area and having a gun focus. Uh, just because, you know, it really is the guns that are causing the most damage and, and that that deserves the, the greatest. So that, that would be, that, that, that would be a, the, uh, you know, in a, a reasonably realistic scenario, what I would do. Your, your question is, did the um, surge of incarceration have the effect of reducing violent crime. Right. Um, and of course we have seen uh, a reduction in violent crime. The, the epidemic of youth violence peaked in 1993 and has declined extraordinarily since then, as have property crimes. Um, and so that we are, are living uh, in a, a relatively safe time that unmatched since um, the Kennedy era. So what I would um, say ab about the influence that the mass incarceration has had on, on that is that, uh, yes, it, it uh, almost certainly has made uh, some contribution to the reduction in crime. Uh, now, it, it's made it at considerable cost, uh, but I, I think that it would be hard to believe that it was irrelevant, g given the scope um, of the increase that Michael was showing us at the at the beginning of his um, uh, the beginning of, of his presentation, the, the only other thing I would say about it, though, you have to be very careful uh, about doing these uh, kind of mental correlations between things. So I've I've pointed out in in various things that there is starting in. In 1980, there have been sustained periods where the crime rates were going up uh, and the violent crime rates have been coming down. But there have been other periods where the incarceration rates were going up um, and the uh, violent crime rate was going up. So sometimes there's a positive relationship, sometimes there's a negative relationship, sometimes there's no relationship. Uh, and so you have to dig pretty deep before you get to anything that looks like evidence in, in this. All right, thanks Thank very, much. very much.